want to second the, uh, the enjoyment factor with the Spanish song. Thank you, Nina Bella. So awesome. And we're in our third week now of a new series called Radical Orthopraxy. If orthopraxy is not a word that you're familiar with, it actually comes from the Greek. And ortho means straight. Like if you go to the orthodontist, what do they do to your teeth? They straighten them, right? And then praxy has to do with like practices or lifestyle. So what we're, what we're really after in this idea of radical orthopraxy is that we would see the surpassing worth of following Jesus and then reorient our lives around that conviction. And that's what we're calling radical orthopraxy. And this morning, I want to talk about a practice, an ancient practice that literally is as old as creation. And it's called Sabbath. And so when we think about Sabbath, we think about something that God actually designed. And if, if God designed it, then it never goes away. If God designed it, then we can believe that if we follow the design, that's going to lead to the most uh, uh, positive, flourishing results. And as a matter of fact, there's been a great example in the news in, uh, in this last kind of several years. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, which, sorry if that's a trigger and, and you're like, like, like let's, let's, get, let's get past it, but during the pandemic, one of the things that was rad that happened was at all of our United States national parks, which if you didn't know, there's 63 of them, 63 national parks in the United States, nine in California, and park rangers began to notice because it basically nobody could go there. And park rangers started to notice that, that this flourishing started to kind of come back to the national parks and Yosemite and all, all these different parks. And trees that they hadn't seen in a long time started growing. And colors and flowers that they hadn't seen in a long time started to show up. And, and bugs and animals that they hadn't seen in a long time started showing up. And the idea was that, w- that when we weren't kind of uh, uh, exploiting the land by having everybody come and bring their pollution and their noise and their all, all trampling through it, that, the, that, that it started to come back to life. And there's actually a passage in the Torah, in the Old Testament, in Exodus 23, where God prescribes that we would do this with the land. That every seven years, we would give the land a rest. That's part of how God designed it to be. And so it's no surprise that when we actually give it a rest, we start to see some flourishing, right? You you ever think of somebody who's like, I don't believe in faith, I believe in science. Well, what do you do when science points to your faith, right? (laughs) And it's no surprise. As a matter of fact, park rangers, and I actually uh, got to meet one. It was a, a, a cousin of somebody I work with at the fire department. It's a park ranger. And he said they had this whole campaign, this whole with, with internal campaign with the park rangers and, and conservationists. And they wanted to start a new rhythm where they would give each of the, of the national parks a break every seven years. And it got shut down due to greed and money. Let's all together give a unanimous boo, right? (laughs) On that note, I'm going to invite you to stand, and we'll read today's, one of today's passages together, and we stand just to get our bodies ready, like a shortstop in baseball gets ready uh, in case they hit the ball to them. We we want to be ready for what God wants to say to us uh, this morning, and so Exodus 20, 9 through 11. You are to labor six days and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work. You, your son or daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock, or the resident alien who is within your city gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in it. He made them in six days, and then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. This is God's word, and you may be seated. So just like, just like God designed the land to flourish, if we would obey him and give the land rest, 
then the land will flourish. And just like that's true, we believe that's true for us as humans. That God designed us to live in this rhythm of work hard six days and rest on the seventh day. And if we think we know better, if we choose not to follow the design, then we're kind of like some of the firefighters that I work with, that they go and they buy a really like $70,000 truck, and this truck has been designed by, by, with expert technology, expert engineers, and then these firefighters go to Pet Boys or whatever on Amazon, they start ordering a new suspension, they start ordering bigger tires, and they start changing everything from the way it's designed, and then they have the audacity to come in around the coffee table and complain about how their car's having all kinds of problems, and they're not getting the gas mileage that Ford told them they were going to get, because you're not following the design. And just like that, we're supposed to Shabbat, and that's the Hebrew word, Shabbat, and it comes from a root word, Shin Bet Tav, in Hebrew, and it literally means to cease, or to end, like the end of a day, or to rest, and the word Shabbat, which we translate as Sabbath, it literally means he rested, because God made everything that he made in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. And so here's the question that we might ask ourselves today. Should we still keep the Sabbath? Should we keep, still keep the Sabbath? And I would say, here are two interpretive thoughts that I want to lay before you. The first is, just like we see the national parks flourishing when we follow God's design and we rest, we should expect that if we would follow in this Sabbath rhythm, we would flourish. It would be good for us. It's a gift from God designed into creation that if we would obey it, we would get the best results possible. You want to live the best life possible? Well, God tells you how. And it includes Shabbat or Sabbath. And Jesus actually prescribed Sabbath to us. So it is actually a New Testament follow-up. It's not, it's not done away with. And Jesus prescribes it actually as a gift from God for us. And we're going to talk about that in a little while. But the question, should we keep the Sabbath? I would just start here with a confession. I've, in my Sabbath journey, I used to think, not that long ago actually, I used to believe that Sabbath was just an Old Testament thing. Anybody else? Yeah, Sabbath is like an Old Testament thing. Uh, but now, I've kind of transitioned to, wow, I think I should, I should keep the Sabbath. And then, more recently, I really want to keep the Sabbath. And that's as far as I've gotten, consistently. And consistently. So we can all... One more time, say together, boo, right? But here are some of my excuses. I am super busy, right? I work for the fire department. That's 56 hours a week, just my regular, and then force hires and overtimes and all, all those things. And then I have a, a family, and I have this, and I have all the other things that I do. I am super busy. Also, I have ADHD, like, super bad. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but, like, if a squirrel ran through here, distracted, okay? <laughs> and so I just don't love the idea of, like, slowing down. It's not comfortable for me. And my work schedule at the fire department is weird because it runs on a nine-day work cycle, not a seven-day. So that means I never have every Tuesday off or every Wednesday off or every Monday off. So that makes it hard to go, oh, you know, Saturday will be my Sabbath. Well, what do I do when I got to show up at the fire department? That being said, I also went and had a shoulder surgery and was off for a whole year. And I didn't keep the Sabbath. <laughs> and so, like many of you probably know, sometimes the excuses that we're giving 
are not the total story or all the reasons, or the real reason. And I found that to be true. That's my confession. That's my confession before the Lord. And that's my confession to you guys. But I would tell you this. I am more committed than ever to figure out how to keep Sabbath. And I want to invite you guys to begin this journey with me. So if you're like, I haven't been doing it, I'm busy, all the excuses, welcome to the club, we're all in this together, I think we can figure it out together. And the main thing I want us to see is, it's so good for us if we would do it, right? So the very reason why we find it difficult is probably a lot of the exact same reasons why we should really figure out how to do it, because it would be so good for us. And the number one excuse worldwide throughout history, the number one excuse for, this biz, uh, for, 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 uh, for us to not do it, we'll all say it together, we're too busy. We're too busy. The Chinese character for busy, the Chinese character for busy, actually comes from two words, heart and death. And if you know anything about Chinese medicine, they're pretty far advanced as far as Western in the idea of natural remedy. See, in, the West, in our Western culture, what do we do with busyness? We give you a day planner. We take you to a Stephen Covey class to be more effective, right? We, 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 we invent a light bulb so you can keep the factory open all day long. We figure out TiVo so that you won't miss your shows. You can get to it when you get to it. We change church schedules, right? We have church on Friday, Saturday, and whenever you can make it, we'll come. Or just do it online during the week, right? And if all that doesn't work, you could go to 7-Eleven, you get a five-hour energy drink, you could just keep going. <laughs> and the Chinese have figured out from this ancient practice that that leads to heart death. And the American Medical Society agrees busyness Rush, hurry, anxiety, these things, not sleeping, not resting, these things lead and contribute to things like cancer and heart disease. All because we don't want to obey the Lord when he simply tells us, no, you need to rest. Thomas Merton observed that the most pervasive form of violence in the modern world is busyness. Not drugs, not guns, but busyness. And it just makes sense, right? Busyness is literally, it's a silent killer. When you think about mental health, there's actually a name to describe what, I, what, what I'm plagued with. It's called hurry sickness. And experts are saying that you can actually have hurry sickness. And I would describe hurry sickness as when you feel like you're so busy, it's the condition of feeling perpetually busy and finding it difficult to unplug and be present. So literally, I won't have anything on my schedule. I will go to the beach and walk with my dog and my family, and I, and I have a hard time just being present and not feeling these anxiety things like you should be doing something else. Hurry up and get back to the car so you could get back home and be productive, right? I experience that all the time. And it's called hurry sickness. And it's killing us. Mark Twain said that busyness is like the weather Everyone complains about it, but no one does anything about it. And Sabbath is one of the ways that we can do something about it. And Mark Buchanan, am I off here? There you go. Mark, Mark Buchanan in his book, The Rest of God, said, the golden rule for the Sabbath is to cease from what is necessary and to embrace what gives life. See, that's the way that we live in our Western culture. I just need to. That's, it's, it's all necessary. And he's saying, that's all fine and good six days. But on the seventh day, you need to stop and rest and embrace what gives life. 
And the Sabbath, we'll find, is actually more than just a rest issue. The Sabbath is a trust issue. Trusting God. The reason why I can't stop is because I don't trust that if I stop, everything won't fall apart. That God's got me. That God has, ha, 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 is still at work even when I'm resting. So Sabbath actually requires us to surrender. Sabbath is a, is a weekly surrender to God. Surrender requires trust, doesn't it? Or, or desperation, <laughs> right? Like when I got my shoulder surgery, I had to surrender and actually sign away, surrender that they would put me asleep and they would do what they needed to do. I needed to surrender to that. There's so many ways that we surrender or desperation. My shoulder got so bad I didn't have another choice, right? And, and Sabbath needs to be like this. We surrender ourselves to God or, or for some of us, we get so burnt out that we have to check out, right? We wait too long and now it's desperation, but we're all going to need rest. Why not add it into our life as a normal healthy rhythm is the idea. Ken Shigematsu says this, the truth is that we may be busy because we feel a need to validate our worth. Sabbath gives us a chance to step off the hamster wheel and listen to the voice that tells us we are beloved by God. How many of you need to hear that this morning? The Sabbath heals us from our compulsion to measure ourselves by what we accomplish, who we know, and the influence we have. Sorry, influencers. And Sabbath enables us to define ourselves less by our achievements and more as beloved daughters and sons of God as we become more aware of how much we are cherished as God's children, we grow in our trust of God. So now that we're on the same page, we don't have to Sabbath, everybody. We get to. It's a get to. So how? How do we Sabbath? What does that look like? This is what it looks like to Sabbath in the most practical, contextual ways. To Sabbath means these four things. To stop, to rest, to delight, and then to worship. To stop is a decision. To stop is you put it on your calendar and you keep it. To stop is the decision you make. To rest is the, is the aim. That's what we're trying to accomplish, to rest. To delight is the vibe. Sabbath should actually be a delight, not a burden. And then to worship, that's the telos. That's the end goal. That's, that's the result. So I want to walk through what this might look like for us this morning. What would a Sabbath look like in our current day uh, 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 condition, right? And I want us to remember... It's a commandment, not a suggestion. Sabbath is a commandment, not a suggestion. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Do you guys know that? And so Eugene Peterson says, nothing less than the force of a commandment has the power to make us stop. We, we need to do this. We stop for Sabbath both, be, both because it's an act of obedience right? We trust God, and because it's a gift from God for our souls, and we want to open it and enjoy it because God gave it to us. So I want to invite you guys to stand for a second time. And I want you to listen to two words of advice from some great authors, and then one, one more picture. I just want you to stand because I want you to really absorb this. Wayne Mueller says, we stop because it's time. We don't, Sabbath requires surrender. If we only stop when we're finished, 
our emails, our, our projects, we will never stop because we're never completely done. I just got to get this one more thing done, right? That's so me. It never happens. Walter Brueggemann says, in our own contemporary context of the rat race, of anxiety, the celebration of Sabbath is an act of both resistance and an alternative. It is resistance because it is a visible insistence that our lives are not defined by our production or our consumption of all that the world is trying to sell us. So punk rock, right? It's a resistance against the way of life. And then we hear Jesus' words in Mark 2, 23 through 28. On the Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to make their way, picking some heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, Have you never read what, what David and those who were with him did when he was in need and hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests. And also he gave some to his companions. Then he told them the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So then the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. You may be seated. So let me ask you guys a question when you read this passage Jesus is, is, is accused of doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. How many of you guys think that Jesus broke the Torah and, uh, rules on the Sabbath? Sounds like that, though, doesn't it? Some of you just aren't bold enough to say it. <laughs> well, here's what's really going on. In the Hebrew scriptures, uh, the Hebrews would call their scriptures the Tanakh, right? And... If you're familiar with Hebrew, usually it'll just be the consonant letters, which is T-N-K, and the vowels would actually not even be there. We add those later. So T-N-K is an, is an acronym, and it stands for Torah, which is the law, or the Pentateuch. It's the first five books of the Bible. The Old Testament scriptures that Jesus followed was Torah, Nevi'im, which is the prophets. Have you ever heard Jesus say, talk about the law and the prophets? He's talking about the Tanakh right? The, he, he would have said the Torah and the ne- Nevi'im. And then the Ketuvim is the writings. And that, that, that encompasses all of the, the, uh, all of the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. Now, Jesus never broke from Tanakh. Jesus never broke from Torah. But what happened is the Hebrew leaders over time added more and more interpretations and, and rules. And so Jesus never broke the Sabbath. What he did, not the, not the Tanakh Sabbath, he only broke what these rulers and leaders had kind of added to it. And so when they're accusing him of breaking Sabbath, he's not really breaking Sabbath. He's keeping Sabbath, and then he's reinterpreting it for them. You guys got Sabbath all wrong. Sabbath is not supposed to be a burden. It's supposed to be a gift. It's supposed to be life-giving. Literally, when you think about David, he's out and his his people are starving to death. And what if they had kept the rule? Oh, there's bread, but you're not supposed to eat that bread. Let's let them die? That's crazy, right? We all see that? But the Pharisees don't see that. And so Jesus is using this as an analogy. And the whole point is that Sabbath is supposed to be a gift from God. It's supposed to be rest that leads to delight, that restores your soul and leads to worship. And it's important to say there's a difference between Shabbat and slothfulness. It's not being lazy. You're supposed to work hard for six days. And by the way, what that includes is, that includes your job, if you have a job, right? Your employment, and it includes, the work includes, if, if, if you're a mom or a dad or a, or, a, or, or a neighbor, right? Or if you're doing work around your house or in the neighborhood or volunteer work, you know, for church or all these different, th- work is just 
all the work, going shopping and buying all the supplies you need and cooking and cleaning and doing all those things, work. And then on the, you do that six days, and then the seventh day, you rest. That's the idea. And once we make a choice to say we're going to stop, the next thing is we need to figure out how to rest. What does it look like to rest? Rabbi Abraham Heschel, which is one of the leading Jewish scholars in the 20th century, he calls uh, Sabbath a sanctuary in time. Each week is a sanctuary in time. A time to be with God. A time of, of a, a sanctuary is like a special dwelling place to be with God. It's set apart, right, in, in time on the seventh day. He says... In keeping Sabbath, we express our love for God by trusting that he will provide for us even while we're resting. Check this out. Eugene Peterson, I already mentioned him, but he brings up this idea that in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the book of Genesis, and in our Scriptures, uh, when you look at the way God created things, a day begins in the evening. When does your day begin? In the morning. Like some of you are like 5 a.m., some of you are like 10 a.m., whatever. But it's like the morning, right? Isn't this interesting that the Bible actually describes a day, there was an evening and there was a morning in that progression. Evening came and then morning. Evening came and then morning. And then on the last one, God saw all that he had made and it was very good indeed. Every evening came and then morning. And then it says, the next line it says, So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed in that rhythm. And on the seventh day, God had completed his work, all that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. For on it he rested from all his work of creation. And so Eugene Peterson suggests that the day that God created, the design, began with supper. It began with a meal with friends and family. And then the very next thing would have been slumber, to sleep. And then you would wake up in the morning to a day that God has already been at work in. And you would wake up to partner with God in what he's already doing. Imagine if we lived with that vibe. Imagine if we lived with that attitude. Like God's been at work all day. You get to work. You wake up, you get to work, and you just check in with God like, okay, where are we at? Like I want to enter in now. I'm just partnering with it. I'm not the one in charge. You're in charge. All the stress is not on me, right? All the anxiety is not on me. It's all on you. Just waking up to this. And that is the way God intended our hearts to live. That's what our endocrine system is supposed to be experiencing, not all the stress and anxiety and cortisol and all of those things. And so this idea of Shabbat. Now, what does it look like? What does it look like for us to actually rest? What what would soul rest look like for you? That's a question. And this is what I want us to be kind of exploring right now in our, in, our, in our Shabbat journey. What can you do and what can't you do on Shabbat? Can you garden? Can you watch football? Can you cook? Can you shop? Can you drive? Can you work out? Can you watch a movie? Well, let, let me ask you this. Do those things feel like work to you? Or do those things feel like rest to you? If you're a, if you're a, a, a farmer, maybe gardening, if that's what you do all week long, maybe you should rest from that. But if you just love to go out in the garden and it's just refreshing to your soul, yeah, you can garden. 
I don't know that you would want to like binge watch 10 hours of Netflix. But if there's a wonderful movie that you could watch with your friends, I'd say like, is it restful? Does it give, does it bring life to you? Can you cook? Is cooking feel like work to you? Or does cooking feel like something different, something, something peaceful, something enjoyable, something delightful, right? Can you drive? Well, is, is that, what, what does that produce in you? Right? Like, like if I'm going to drive down Lamita Boulevard, I don't know, maybe I want to avoid that. Or like a nice long road, like road trip in the country. Like what's, the whole idea is do something different that's restful for you. And this is the exploration for us, right? It's going to be different for all of us. Like for some of you, inviting people over to your house, inviting some friends and family over is life-giving for you. Well, do that on the Sabbath if you want. For others of you, let's be honest, it wipes you out. Do that the other days. We still need community. Still invite people over, but just don't make that part of your Shabbat. Like what's restful for you? Some suggestions for, 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 for Sabbath rest. Have some foods on Sabbath that you don't have any other days, right? Like, like it's some enjoyable, like if, 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 if you're dieting, make Shabbat your cheat day, right? Hashtag Shabbat waffles, right? Hold the bacon if you're Jewish. Have a box of toys that you only pull out on Shabbat for your kids to play with and start to teach them that Shabbat's special, Shabbat's delight, Shabbat's wonderful. Now, here's the thing. You don't take a break from parenting. And so as, as your kids are growing up, it's not, it's, not, it's not supposed to be a burden. You have to figure out how to do this, and your kids are in the way of my Shabbat, right? No, you're raising them up with this rhythm. And so you're teaching them these things that God has given us a special gift that we don't have to kill ourselves working all the time. He wants us to rest. If you're married, engage in a little hanky-panky. <laughs> if you're not married, that's a whole other talk. What leads you to feel like you're resting? That's the point. That's what we should be thinking about. Not what are the rules, what does my soul need to rest? And so this leads us to the idea of delight. I love this quote from Mark Buchanan again, and his book is called Rest of God. It says, Sabbath is a reprieve from doing what you ought to do, even though the list of oughts is infinitely long and never done. Oughts are tyrants, noisy, and surely chronically dissatisfied. In other words, the oughts will always be there. You're never going to sh shut them up, right? They're always going to be something else that gives you an ought. Sabbath is the day you trade places with them. They go into the proverbial salt mines, and you go out dancing. General rule of Shabbat is do some different things than you do all the other days. Make Shabbat a delight. It should be the day of the week you most look forward to. It's a gift from God. Again, make it a cheat day if you're dieting, right? Learn to see Shabbat as a gift for your soul. And now we're going to get to the telos, worship. We stop, we rest, we delight, and then one of the main benefits of a proper Sabbath should be true worship. True worship is when our hearts are responding to the goodness of God. Now think about this in reverse engineering style. When, when you're super busy, someone's bugging you, you just drove through traffic, you were, showed up late to work, Right? You've got a whole list of things to do and not enough time to do it. And then you, 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 you walk into a space. How are you walking into that space? Like an anxious presence, right? 
Are, are you able to, to worship? Are you able to give the people that are present there with you your best you? Probably not. I, I, I can't. And so what, what Sabbath does, it allows us to stop and to rest and to delight and to reset ourselves for the next week, for the six days of work. An analogy that I would maybe use is think of somebody who's playing a guitar. You ever seen somebody play a guitar, and what do they do before they play their guitar up on the stage? They tune their guitar, right? And they spend time tuning their guitar so that when they get on stage, they can play the proper song. Sabbath is a way for us to tune our hearts so that when we live the rest of our lives, it's worship. Another analogy would be an axe. I like this one as a firefighter, right? It, it, it makes sense to take time to sharpen your axe before you just go to work chopping down something, right? And I just thought about it, like a guitar is also called an axe. Is that why? Don, do you know? Is a guitar called an axe because you tune it? And then it is, right? I was today years old when I figured that out, Right? And so the idea here is that, that Sabbath is, is a time for us to tune in to worship. We don't force ourselves to be worshipers. We stop, figure out how, what does this day look like as a rest day, make it a delight, and then trust God to do that work in your soul where at, by the end of the day and into the week, you're starting off as a worshiper. That's worship. And I want to ask the worship team to come back up. And the, the Jewish tradition, Shabbat would include a service in the synagogue, or what we do here as like church service. So they would, they would have a day, they would stop. If you're Jewish, they'd stop. They would rest. They would delight. They would show up to synagogue, and they would do it together. And we follow that tradition in our Christian tradition. Coming to church is a time where we stop and we come here to rest, to be instructed, to be trained, right? To be encouraged, uplifted, and to retune our hearts towards worship. And when we're here, we might not come here ready to worship. Maybe you did, but you should still come even if you're not ready to worship. And then we go through that process. God, change my heart. Tune my heart like a guitar. Sharpen my heart like an axe. And we may even get to the point where we're singing where we're still not ready. But we still stand up and we sing because he's worth it. And as we're doing that, we're asking God, tune my heart to the rhythm of worship. Make me, make me a worshiper again. Prepare me for the week, right? Right? And so I want to do one last thing, and we're going to get into worship. On the back of your sheet, you'll notice there's, there's three kind of entry points if you want to start uh, to practice Shabbat. We'll go over there, those at the end. But before we do that, I want to invite you to stand one more time. I want to read one last passage from Jesus. And it's an invite, it's an invite for each of us to soul rest. So as I read this, I want you to hear this as an invite for Jesus, from Jesus. And after I read this, we're going to enter into a time of worship. And if you want to come forward and kneel at the carpet, you're more than welcome to do that. If you want to head back to the back where Sam is and, and our prayer team is um, during worship, go back and get prayed for. They'd love to pray for you. If you want to just stay where you're at, that's totally fine. But the lights will come down, and we'll go ahead and do that now. And I want you to hear this invite from Jesus and decide whether you want to take him up on this invite. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke, which is like a rule of life, a way of a rhythm, Six days of work, 
One day of rest is part of Jesus' yoke. Take up my yoke and learn from me because I'm lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light.